Good morning. Uh, thank you for joining my session called Serverless as a Collaborative Economy Enabler. I know that's a mouthful, uh, but we'll go into that in just a bit. Um, I'd like to start with a very brief introduction about myself. My name is Bart Blomarts. I work at Ordina here in Belgium. Um, more specifically in a, a business unit called JWorks. Uh, we do Java and JavaScript. And if you have any questions for me, remarks, or just want to shout out something, you can always reach me via my t Twitter handle. Um, so okay, let's get started about with serverless. Um, what is serverless? Um, now before I start actually, I learned a lot during the conference already, but I have some questions for you guys. Um, who in here regularly uses, um, for example, infrastructure as a service? So every day, professionally, okay, that's about 15-20%. Um, platform as a service, so Cloud Foundry, that's surprisingly, that's like three people of you. Okay, great, I did not ex uh, expect that. Um, you did? Okay. Um, to explain servers, I would like to draw uh, a comparison. You all know this guy, right? <laughs> Clueless. It must mean not having a clue. Everybody okay? All right. So, obviously serverless means not having any servers, right? Maybe not exactly. Um, the existence of servers from an application development point of view will be hidden for the developers. But obviously, the applications that we built need to run on something. Um, I read a very interesting article a couple of weeks ago about um, being able to run uh, IT stuff on DNA, but, but that, that's not what I'm talking about. Now, um, if, if you look at the, the, the rise of cloud computing, we see that it's delivered a lot of, of new interesting stuff. Um, it has the, the path that you guys should really be looking at. Um, we have um, cloud native applications, we have software defined everything. Um, so, and I believe that serverless really might be the, the next step in, in the, the evolution of cloud computing. Um, but if it doesn't mean no more servers, um, maybe it means no more worries. That would be nice, right? Um, in the serverless um, way of working, we will be outsourcing the servers to, uh, most of the time, a cloud vendor. Meaning that some of the hassles that um, exist um, when managing servers will be uh, outsourced also to the specific cloud provider. They will run, optimize the servers for us so that we don't need to think too much about security updates, etc. Uh, now, of course, if this worry kind of disappears, it also means that we're putting a lot of trust in our uh, provider that we're choosing from, because they will run our applications. Next slide will be a bit controversial in this room. No more operations. Who thinks that serverless means no more operations? Raise of hands. No one, all right, you guys are good. Um, obviously, it doesn't mean no more operations. Um, it might mean that we are going to also be outsourcing um, some of the operations to a specialized outsourced team that lives within the walls of the cloud provider. Now, on the other hand, if you look at it from an application uh, point of view, we're still going to need uh, people uh, maintaining, deploying, uh, and all of those things um, of our application. Now, Today, serverless is still pretty new. Um, it's not very mature yet, and there's a large opportunity for tooling. Um, I added the slide uh, yesterday evening. It's just a, a GitHub URL that shows a huge list of frameworks that um, are built to help people making serverless applications. So if you really have a, a, an ops mindset, well, most of the room uh, in here has, you should definitely look at the URL. Uh, most of these are open source. They're ex um, uh, accepting a uh, pull request or, or issues or everything, you can really um, make a difference and then use this opportunity to uh, build serverless applications. Uh, just uh, to make sure, managing servers, every, you guys know that probably better than I do, it takes a lot of time. Um, it is error prone um, and obviously it is, it is difficult. Um, and I believe in the serverless world that the operation task will actually become more important than it is today. Because there might be uh, a new way of working in, in DevOps teams. The, the operation team might not be sitting next to you, but at the same time, they will need to uh, provide uh, infrastructure tooling um, to make the serverless way of uh, working. Now, I actually had a, a chat with, a, with an, an old friend of mine saying, well, I'm, I'm not buying this serverless Kool-Aid. Um, I'm not drinking it. Um, it. It's just like some kind of thing. Yes? You have a question? Go. 
Oh, I will be uh, giving some demos later, uh, if you have the time for that. So good question. Um, I'm happy to be able to answer to it. Um, so um, an old friend of mine was saying, I'm not buying this this uh, the serverless thing. I don't think it works. And serverless, it will probably not be replacing everything. Um, nobody also um, thinks that it's going to exp um, change everything. But one thing that we definitely know, what I'm very sure about, is that it's changing the way we work with the cloud. It will change uh, things like, for example, like pricing. There is a, re a real evolution uh, going in there. Um, since we have uh, established that serverless doesn't mean uh, no more servers, a, a different name uh, might be better. And some uh, very bright uh, people on Twitter came up with FAST, saying function as a service. So we will be uh, writing functions. Um, and I will use FAST and, and serverless probably uh, intermingled. But if, if you um, want to learn more about it, definitely a, a nice term to be looking at it. Um, now we've been talking about serverless uh, for a couple of minutes now, and I've mainly been saying what it doesn't, what it isn't. So let's um, reverse that and talk about what serverless actually is. Uh, serverless is um, first and foremost it's event driven. Um, when you choose a certain um, cloud provider, you will be able to integrate with other events that they're sending. So for example, if you're using uh, AWS, you will be able to use uh, events from DynamoDB, uh, from SNS, from S3, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, quick question, who over here uses uh, AWS regularly? So there are pe more people using AWS than there are people that are working with EAS. That's interesting, interesting. Um, a key characteristic also of serverless is the paper execution. Um, there are no running servers. So from an application point of view, your responsibility, if you're develop some, developing something, there will be no server running. When you're executing a request, only at that particular moment in time, a server will spin up, and when the request gets, is done, the server is going to be uh, turned down again. So during these short uh, periods of your, ap your application that's being run, only at that particular moment in time, you will be paying for what's being executed. So this means that serverless provides, um, works with a very small operational cost. Um, if, you, if you talk to us about, about management, they will love this. And Chris is very skeptical, I can see it. Um, an example with AWS, so this is um, a, a, a log line just from, from the debug log, I will show it uh, with the demo later on, where we see my uh, application, where my, my function was running for uh, 61 uh, milliseconds, and I was built for 100 uh, milliseconds. Um, so there is no running server that I need to be paying, uh, need to be paying for 24-7. And if you look at the, the free tiers that you're receiving every month, you get over 3 million um, seconds that you can use just, just for free, just experimenting, having fun. And also afterwards, um, the, the price is, is, is pretty low. Obviously, this depends on usage. If you have um, 100 million requests every second, then prices will go up. Because Amazon also wants to make money. Yeah, I, you didn't expect that. I, I get it. Another key characteristic of, um, of serverless is the seamless scaling. Uh, and scaling is like also a key feature of, of serverless because you're not provisioning anything. Um, generally, when you're provisioning your, your pass or, or your on-premise ap um, applications, you need to tell the server, okay, I want this amount of memory, I want this amount of whatever. And it's also, it's, it's like guessing, right? You can have uh, a lot of uh, observations that you made in the past to do good guesswork, uh, but in the end, you're still guessing and the risk for under or over provisioning is real. Um, now, you have the possibility to give your function um, specific uh, parameters, for example, how many memory you want it to consume. Uh, that, that's still possible. Um, and how this is, work, is working, that the, the serverless providers, they will spin up short-lived uh, compute containers uh, for you. And this compute container will actually live longer than your function within the container. Now, um, it is up to the supplier of your uh, serverless infrastructure to define when they are going to tear down the container. So you can't rely on it. There have been tests with AWS saying that currently, you know, today, it's, taking, it's running for about uh, four hours every compute container, but you should not be relying on that. However, you can optimize for it, um, as I will show you later on. Um, yeah, that's what I wanted to tell about this. Um, there have been a lot of talks at this... Uh, a nice conference is about uh, stateless. Um, serverless is by definition stateless for the very simple reason that there is no server running between invocations. 
so if you want to preserve some kind of state, you will need a database, um, the file system, or like a cross-application cache, for example, like Redis. Uh, so that, that's something very important. I mean, we have seen this when we're building microservices, cloud-native applications, but in serverless, there is no, um, no possibility to do it wrong. So there is no server running between uh, invocation, invocations. Uh, next slide might also be uh, slightly controversial. Serverless is easier. Um, obviously, you can write a bunch of crappy code, and then it will not be easier. Um, but in the uh, serverless world, when you're writing a function, it will only be executing one specific thing. You cannot have a, a monolithic application in, in a serverless uh, way of working, because it just doesn't make any sense. Quick recap. Um, so, serverless is uh, about less server management. Uh, it's event-driven, paper execution. The seamless scaling is very important. It is stateless and it's easier. Um, before I go on to uh, the suppliers, any questions on like the base uh, that I've already talked about right now? Yes, go ahead. I, I have an entire uh, part of my presentation dedicated to that. So I love the question, but let me do that uh, at the end. I have, I have a cool demo showing that, okay? Um, suppliers, I'm pretty sure all of you know my, uh, my very good friend Pablo, he's also a supplier, uh, but <laughs> it's a different kind of supplier. Um, now what, what we notice is that um, all of the major cloud providers have really jumped this serverless bandwagon, and to me that, that is an indication that it, it is important. Um, nobody uh, wants to be left out, and obviously what these cloud providers are doing is they're making sure that their solution integrates very nicely with their other offerings. Um, so I'd like to start now giving a, a high-level demo of these uh, providers, and then I will give some. Um, um, I'd like to give a high-level presentation of the uh, serverless providers, and then I will want to show you a demo with an actual ap application that I think makes sense in a serverless uh, world. So. Um, most famous one is AWS Lambda. It was actually not the first one uh, to start with serverless. Google did something very similar a couple of years ago, but uh, Lambda is like the most famous one. Uh, they uh, started the initiative in uh, 2014. Um, and AWS Lambda often gets used uh, together with the API gateway, as I will show you later. And in the API gateway, you can do a synchronous request to uh, an HTTP call that will then trigger uh, an event uh, in Lambda. Uh, and as you can expect from AWS, it will nicely integrate with um, DynamoDB, uh, S3, SNS, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Another, another big player is IBM Bluemix OpenWhisk. Um, Bluemix is the platform as a service from IBM. It's based on Cloud Foundry. And OpenWhisk uh, is built on top of Bluemix. Um, now, two things that are particular uh, about IBM Bluemix. OpenWhisk is that it's open source. It is um, the entire source code is available on GitHub, and they even provide uh, an, an easy how-to guide on if you want to install this on premise. Not entirely sure why you want this kind of application on premise, but it is possible to do that. And the second thing that I particularly like about Bluemix is uh, its user interface, its user experience. The ease of use with IBM is, is just a lot better than uh, with AWS. I mean, AWS, Amazon, they're not really famous for their user interfaces. N not going to say that they suck, but they suck. So. Um, it's, IBM has really a, a nice way of, of presenting that. Um, you will see the difference in a bit. That's definitely, uh, very possibly a reason, um, but they're uh, investing a lot of money, a lot of time in, in their um, the user interface. So it's all changing uh, rapidly in that uh, as well. I was actually doing a similar presentation at uh, Jax a couple of weeks ago, and the day before my presentation, they had changed the API gateways layout. So it's really great if you want to do a live demo uh, at that moment. Uh, but it, it is true. Most of these providers will um, uh, come up with a CLI that you can do everything um, just via an API command line so that you will be able to, to script it, uh, et cetera. Um, Microsoft Azure uh, Cloud Functions. Um, as expected, well, it works with the Azure uh, Cloud. It integrates uh, with, with, with all their other offerings. But what is also interesting with Microsoft is that they also provide a very easy way of working with other um, SaaS solutions. So for example, if you want to um, have a serverless function that is going to write a file to Google Drive, it just works by clicking some stuff around, and it's very, very easy working. Um, 
I also like their UI. There's one thing I really don't like about Microsoft, and that's the fact that they keep on sending me invoices um, for, for some stuff. Um, so that's also why I'm not going to be uh, demoing it today. Um, if you really want to see, then then come over, or maybe during the open spaces or something, then I'll, I'll set it up again. But right now, I've, I've disabled it because I just don't want them to continuously send me invoices. Um, the last one of, of the, like the, 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 the big four is the Google Cloud. Um, they have an offering called Google Cloud Functions. Currently, it's in private alpha. Uh, meaning that I'm actually not allowed to say a great deal about it. There's one thing that I can mention is that I know why it's in private alpha. Um, there is still they're, they're not on the same level yet as, as the other three. Um, however, there's a lot of um, um, buzz going on on their forums if you're if you're in, in the alpha program. So they're working on it very very hard, and I'm pretty sure when they leave the alpha phase that um, they will have a very nice offering. Um, but today it is kind of cumbersome to work with them. Um, and last, but definitely not least, it's not as famous as the previous four, is OutZero Web Task. Um, OutZero is, is not uh, the, the huge cloud provider, um, like, like for example, uh, AWS. But with Web Task, they have focused on keeping it very simple. Um, if you leave this, this talk and you say, OK, I want to have a look at the serverless thing, um, I suggest you start with OutZero, because anybody can, can have a serverless function running in under 30 seconds. Uh, un unless you don't like Node.js. Who, who in here doesn't like Node.js? Ah, oh, so you, you'll, you'll find, you'll be fine. No, it's, it's very easy uh, to, to use uh, OutZero Web Task, and they're also very heavily investing uh, in it. They just released uh, a couple of days ago something called um, Web Task Slash to have um, serverless uh, Slack bot integration. This is also really cool. So definitely worth checking out. So um, I've been talking about serverless uh, for a while now. Now the second part of my uh, talk is about collaborative economy and also showing you a demo where what kind of applications that are useful to uh, have in the serverless world. Um, now in, in collaborative economy, um, yes? Ah, okay. Um, collaborative economy, there's a quote by, by uh, Benita uh, Matowski. She's really like a, a sharing um, economy expert, saying that sharing economy includes the shared creation, production, distribution, trade and consumption of goods and services by different people and organizations. Now, that's a big quote. Um, I highlighted the things that I like about it, um, as you should do with every quote. It's about the creation of services by different organizations. That's like serverless in a nutshell. And what we're also seeing is that serverless and, and the technology that we, that we have today is um, making an old human behavior possible at scale. I mean, we used to be sharing a lot of things earlier. It, it has kind of changed. and. Technology is really like making it reappear. There are um, five layers in collaborative economy. Um, for example, the shareable resources. Um, the common example that everybody always gives are like the, the, the bikes that you can rent in a city. Um, it's idle capacity. If nobody is using that, them, then why can't somebody else use them? Then uh, next up is the... Uh, the device and application. So for example, if you go to the airport and you don't have the possibility to use your smartphone to check in, they can offer tablets or iPads or whatever um, to do the check-in um, at, for example, airports. Uh, the next one is the developer, where multiple um, systems can be connected. Um, this is what I will be talking about uh, in a bit, using SDKs, uh, APIs, uh, etc. Next one uh, is trust, where um, everybody probably over here has used something like a TripAdvisor or, or uh, whatever, whatever application called uh, Yellow or something, where you can rate what you're seeing and then you're in influencing a lot of strangers, so you're the possibility to distribute um, your feelings about something very quickly. And then uh, the last one is, is data. Regarding data, we'll see that um, probably all of your uh, the companies that you work, work for have a lot of data. They have like huge databases containing everything, and, and most of the time, management will look at that data like it's a cost center, because it's, everything is there and you're not using it properly. Maybe you gathered the data once, and then it's just being stuck somewhere in the Oracle or the MySQL or the, the whatever database. Um, if you're in that situation, it would be nice if you can um, create some value. Um, from the data that you have available. And you can do this um, very easily by pub publishing an API and just putting something publicly available uh, on the web and see how other people um, use your API. Maybe they want to use your data, enrich it with their own data. And um, like that, 
um, you can do something with, with your data that today is just being a, a cost center. This is also something that we see with, with large corporations like Facebook or like Uber. They're actually um, giving a lot of data away um, because like that, their data is also just part of the chain uh, and that's what I really like. Now you can say, okay, I'm, I'm just a small startup. I don't have any real data yet or not a lot of data yet. That's great, just use somebody else's data. If a lot of this data is publicly available on, on the web, your ideas, your creativity can maybe change the way that the data is being used in the past, or you can combine data um, from other um, people who are offering this. Uh, and this is where creativity can, can add value. Um, in Belgium, we have also have a service called uh, Realo, who are uh, using or combining a lot of data from uh, different um, well, different providers, and they're cre creating something new and unique just by using the data from the other people. And, and there is also, especially here in Belgium, uh, that I'm aware of, a lot of public data available. Um, the Flemish government has something called the Open Data Initiative, which is like a huge uh, amount of APIs that are available for everybody if you just want to consume and use this data maybe in a, a new and interesting way. Now, it would be strange talking about a collaborative economy and not talking about partners. Um, if you have um, some data and you have a partner that you regularly work with, the two of you can come together and see, okay, if we can use this part of your data and you can use that part of our data, maybe together we can offer something new to, to the public and, and see how other people work with that. So you can create uh, new or tailored APIs of this combined data. How does this relate to serverless? Well. I really believe that serverless enables experimentation. I would have put the font even bigger, but it wouldn't fit my slides. Um, serverless is, is um, by design, relatively cheap. Um, there is no need to provision a lot of servers. So you're just consuming what's being used. And you get a large, a very large free tier, uh, except if you're working with Microsoft, you get a large free tier of, of just uh, consumption data that you can use, consumption computing uh, power that you can use. And even um, if, it, if it gets used more, then you see, okay, my, my, my services is very popular. People are using it, and then maybe you want to pay for it. And if nobody really uses it, well, it probably didn't cost you any money. You're still stuck in the free tier. So this is something that we couldn't do in the past, uh, well, this easy. So if you have um, unpredictable traffic or occasional traffic, just don't worry about it. If it gets used, it will scale up accordingly. So, um, for, for management in the room, in the collaborative economy, uh, serverless really allows you to be part of the value chain. I still haven't answered the question about a typical application, right? I have a demo. Um, so, I have an, uh, an Arduino over here, uh, which was made by a couple of colleagues of mine. Um, and on the Arduino, you will see that there's a temperature sensor and two buttons. And it will actually measure the temperature of the room. Um, now, when it measures this temperature, it is going to send, uh, it will post some JSON to a now zero web task. The web task will look at the content of the JSON that it receives, do some parsing, add some data of its own, and then do the exact same thing. It will post it to an OpenWhisk action. They call it action in OpenWhisk, but it's the same thing as a function. OpenWhisk will do uh, some parsing of the data, adding some data of its own, and then it will uh, call the AWS API gateway, which in return will send an event to AWS Lambda. I'll go a bit quicker now. AWS Lambda is going to put it in a DynamoDB. DynamoDB will stream an event to another AWS Lambda. And finally, that last AWS Lambda will be logging it in CloudWatch. Um, so there's definitely a lot of hops uh, in there. I hope the, the, the network was great, because if I miss the first one, then I can't show you anything else. Um, no, one thing in particular before I show the demo, um, I was talking about frameworks earlier. This um, Lambda over here was built using a framework called the serverless framework. Um, and that is also a, a CLI that's very popular. They uh, received funding for about six million um, dollars two weeks ago or three weeks ago when they, they released their first um, 1.0 version. And what uh, the serverless framework really does, it takes care of a lot of the scaffolding for you. Um, it has some best practices regarding the grouping of functions. So at runtime, you would like to have your specific function so that that function can scale up. But it's like really a pain in the, a different word for S, as um, to deployment. So it will just take a lot of time if you need to deploy that. That's why they're grouping them uh, together. It has complete lifecycle support, so you will be able to create, uh, deploy, invoke your functions. Also, with AWS, the deployment is just 
not really fun way of working. You can change your code via the web editor, but that doesn't change anything. You need to deploy it. Uh, and what is really, really, really cool about the serverless framework is they're working together with Microsoft and IBM to make it um, supplier uh, independent. So this is like the, the dream of having serverless function being um, uh, provider agnostic. Um, and if you want to uh, learn more about it, you can check the, the, uh, the URL. It's also uh, in GitHub. Okay, now let's see. Oh, you guys don't see anything. Um, let's see if it works. So it starts with an error, that's always great. So it's measuring the temperature, then now there's two buttons. One will uh, measure the temperature once and then do the entire hops, and the other one is cont continuously um, measuring the temperature, as you can see. You can't see it. So, measuring the temperature. I know it's not very spectacular, um, but let's see what, what happens behind the scenes. So, well, this is open, so I'll show this one first. This is the uh, open whisk. Um, I will also increase the font a bit. Uh, full screen. The open whisk dashboard. Um, it comes with uh, two tabs, one for develop and one for monitor. So if I uh, refresh it, we should see nothing. All right, that's awesome. Let's send some more requests. See, okay, now there's four more um, function invocations that I've passed in here. Um, if you want to look at the, the development tab, since you guys all love Node.js, um, this is a very simple node function that is just going to parse the JSON and then use a promise to contact uh, AWS. Now, what's really nice about uh, OpenWhisk, and you don't get that with Lambda, is that you can, um, well, you can edit the code in line, uh, but you can also test it in line. So there's like a run button. Um, it's, it's easier if you have a bigger resolution um, where you can send some JSON. Just easy for like testing whatever you're building, and this should turn up uh, green. As you can see, it was built from uh, for 1.9 seconds. Uh, this is the test data. So the test, <laughs> it's not 42 degrees. This is test data, and we can also see um, it's th it's the only number. <laughs> You can see the uh, average invocation time is 1.3 seconds. So every time I invoke the function, I get built for 1.3 seconds. Um, another one I would like to show you is the AWS API gateway. This is actually a different function, but it has more endpoints, so it's uh, nicer to look at. Um, and this, this is this is what like makes life with AWS more difficult because you have to understand what all of these things do, uh, and they keep changing it when I'm doing demos. So that's not fun. But you can also easily uh, test your function and create variables. So for example, if I want to do this for development and I hit the test button, it will be querying um, nothing. Where is the, the output? Oh, it's here. It will be querying some, uh, some cool cars from uh, some DynamoDB. Um, now the API gateway uh, also, nope. The API gateway also works for non-Lambda functions, um, but we're here to talk about the Lambda. So this, for example, gives you an overview of all the uh, functions that are available. Most of the demos I, I have over here are written in a, an older Node version. Um, and you can see again that uh, it is using um, a web editor that you can just quickly uh, play around with. Um, this one doesn't have any triggers, but if you look, for example, at the, the one that processes the streams from DynamoDB, you can see so you have some kind of visual representation of what's going on, um, but it's all still uh, not that easy to use, in my opinion. Um, just as a quick look at uh, DynamoDB, because I like DynamoDB a lot, there is uh, the, the hops table that I created. You can look at the items. I should have... We don't want this. So, yeah, just document database, not that interesting. Um, Where is it? And here you can also see that it's going to trigger another function, which is called the process DynamoDB stream, 
And if I click on it and I'm patient, it will take me right to that function. Um, this is going to log uh, some information to uh, CloudWatch. And in CloudWatch, we can then see uh, that we have, it's the 28th today, so this is my uh, data from earlier. And it's just going to log it. If I close this one again, you see that it's still 42 degrees because of the, the demo that I did in, uh, in OpenWhisk. Now what's missing, I think, today in the serverless world, um, we have a lot of hops, as you saw earlier, um, but what I really would like to have when I'm building this kind of application is something that will aggregate um, everything that is going on, and we don't have that right now. So you can create custom dashboards in AWS, as you can see here, um, but from a tooling uh, point of view, I don't think it's mature enough to building like uh, important applications that you want to be monitoring up very closely. So again, it's really an opportunity, I think, um, if you have like an ops mindset as you guys to go look at uh, the URL that's in the presentation and see if, if you can uh, work with them, um, make everybody's life uh, a bit better. Okay. Yes. Um, you can just program it in the web editor. Oops. No, and you shouldn't. Um, as a best practice, I really suggest choosing an IDE to do this. Um, if you, for example, use um, the serverless framework, you will also be able to execute tests just from the command line, and you, could, you can use any IDE that does uh, syntax highlighting in with notes. Um, that you want. You can also deploy Java functions to uh, AWS Lambda, and then you can use whatever ID that you like that does Java, just import the SDK from Amazon, and you're good to go. But that's a really good question. Um, when I just first started, um, especially in, in, in the Bluemix one, OpenWhisk one, I was editing the codes, and I lost actually what I was doing twice. So the editor is really nice, it does syntax highlighting, it does everything, but it doesn't do version control. Um, and if you're building like a serious application, you, you kind of want to have version control, or you can start over. Um, so um, if you like what you saw, it's all uh, on GitHub available. So this is uh, the different hops that are available uh, right there. And if you'd like to learn more about um, the Arduino uh, way of working, that's on the different URL. I still have nine minutes. Okay, um, best practices, uh, because we don't want to end up like uh, like Walter White over here. Now we see that, um, as I said earlier, all of the, the providers have jumped the serverless bandwagon, um, but it's, it's still early. Um, tooling is not that mature yet. So when you're making a supplier choice, you should probably not be doing what I did and pick all of them. You should look at what kind of um, service provider do I want to work with? Uh, what, I'm, uh, what am I already using today? What services do I want to integrate with? Um, so that's very important to look at that. And also, again, don't do what I did um, if you look at their offering. For example, the way that Microsoft um, handles resources is different from AWS. They made this conscious decision, so it makes a lot of sense um, if, if you go with their program. Uh, but if you just blindly start um, making functions and just executing them all of the time, then you will get invoices that you didn't expect. Uh, regarding tooling, and that, that's the biggest caveat today, um, building and deployment of Microsoft of, uh, functions uh, it's still a bit difficult. Um, the serverless framework is really um, already doing a lot in that regard, but I believe that, that more is still possible. Um, the monitoring part, um, I, I currently hate the state of monitoring uh, functions today. I want to have the possibility to aggregate all of my functions together and get some nice dashboards. So if anybody uh, feels like doing that, um, that would be really cool. Um, also something that's very important to note is that the execution time is limited. So uh, with AWS and actually with most of the other um, as well, there's only uh, five minutes that your function will be able to be running. After five minutes, they will cut, uh, cut it off. So it's not something for if you have like batch processes that you want to run uh, the entire night and, and serverless not that you're looking for. Um, and, and last, um, but probably not least, uh, SLAs. Um, I know that ops people generally don't care about SLAs. It's nah, something like that. Um, if you want to know the SLAs uh, for a uh, AWS, they're very clear about it. None. So it is just 
best efforts. Um, if you have something like that's really business critical, or you're making uh, banking software or, or space shuttles deploying to NASA, go do something else. Um, now, it's in their best interest, of course, to make it stable, to make it reliable, and, and they, will be, they will go a long way to make sure uh, that everything works out great, but they're not uh, having any formal um, promises that they will do to you. As, as um, one of the attendees uh, already mentioned regarding the code, um, use an external editor. Um, learn, from, learn from my mistakes, but do not do it in line. If you just want to, to try something or you want to have like a quick test, then, then the, the, internal, the, uh, the web editor is great. But if you're doing any real work, then, then just use an ID that you prefer. Um, so I skipped the initialization service uh, outside of a function. Um, I mentioned that the provider will stall the start up a compute container for you, and the compute container will be running for a certain amount of time. Currently with AWS it's four hours, and the initialization code of your function only gets run when the new container is spun up. So meaning if you need to do a, a database connection or including NPM libraries or things like that, you should put that outside of your function. Um, I will quickly show how this works. So this is uh, my AWS Oops. This is my AWS function. The initialization code is not in the function, it's initialized before the function, so that the compute container doesn't need to do this every time, and this will also um, lower the invoice that you might be getting. Um, and then the, the last one regarding code is also limit your function size because the, the larger that your function is, the more time uh, it will be running and the more you get built uh, and also the more complex it will get, obviously. Okay, so that was it. Uh, five, time, five minutes for questions. Um, yes? That's when you would use serverless, yes. Or that's when you can use serverless. I mean, you can use it for whatever you want, but that, that to me is like real dif differentiator because you don't have that with, with the platform as a service. There is a very famous quote about uh, Adrian Cockcroft, who works for Amazon um, since, since yesterday, <laughs> since yesterday uh, who said, if you have a, a platform as a service and you can um, run your application for one second and then tear it down again, then you should call it a function as a service, but that's just not what, what's happening with, with platform as a service or with on-premise um, middleware either. Yes? The mic is coming. Um, a question about uh, versioning your functions if you break down your application into multiple functions, then I think versioning becomes key. Are there any special recommendations for versioning functions, or do we I version just in the way we version any REST API? I uh, wholeheartedly agree. Um, in the beginning of, of serverless, they didn't have real support for, uh, for versions. Um, if this is important for you, and it, it probably important for most people. You should look at, for example, the serverless framework who will take uh, care of uh, versions and aliases for you. So for that, I think you believe you need the need tooling. So good question. That's uh, something that's only been added well, a couple of months ago. More questions? I had three slides about no more ops, you guys. There should be more questions. <laughs> yeah, I have a question. Uh, okay. If you have anything afterwards, just hit me up on uh, on Twitter and. Uh um, the only problem I currently see with the serverless is the login with IBM and uh, AWS, Google. They all have their own APIs, their own functions, so. Um, transferring your code from one cloud provider to another will be becoming a hassle then. Well, that's that's true, and I, I actually have two uh, responses to that. Uh, the first one, when you're seriously, seriously using uh, an EAS or a PaaS, there will be vendor lock-in. This is not related to serverless. Um, but 
if tooling gets more mature, for example, with serverless framework, it will be vendor uh, or cloud provider agnostic. So right now, if you want to create a new function using the CLI in serverless, you have to say, okay, I want this function to work with uh, AWS, and the, the, they, they actually already have the branches from IBM and from Microsoft. You, you can start experimenting with that, but it's not on, on their, their master branch yet. But there will be new templates saying, okay, I want to make a function, I want to run it on uh, a different cloud provider so that that's possible. And also in the end, if you look at the, the functions themselves, the code themselves, it's, it's well, my demos are all using uh, Node. You can also be using Java. Uh, so the plumbing will, will um, need to change, but the actual code will normally be, be uh, very similar. More questions? No? 